to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Good morning, friends, and welcome to St. Saviour's Online on this, the last Sunday after the Feast of the Epiphany. This week that we're heading into, we will be observing the, uh, the beginning of the holy season of Lent with Ash Wednesday. And so today we observe the, um, the, the commemoration of the event that we know as the Transfiguration, a great day in the church calendar. So as we gather together here, we want to begin by acknowledging that our community is gathered on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Silk people, of the Okanagan Nation, and we want to recommit ourselves to the work of reconciliation. In a moment of silence, let us begin with prayer. Let us pray. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James, and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors, and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. 
and you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. I come to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the year 988, in the midst of a rebellion by the generals of Constantinople, a political alliance was formed which would forever change the face of European history. Basil II, heir to the Byzantine throne, was facing opposition from all sides, including his own younger brother, who was um, trying to claim the throne from him. In order to shore up his position as the head of the Christian Byzantine Empire, Basil went north and he hired mercenaries from Scandinavia. The, the most powerful ally that Basil could find among the northern pagans was a man known as Vladimir the Rus, the Prince of Kiev. In exchange for Vladimir's service in quelling the rebellion and in an unprecedented move, Basil promised his sister in marriage, the imperial princess Anna. This was an opportunity, like no other for Vladimir, to marry an imperial princess. But in order to solidify the alliance, there was one condition that was required of him. Vladimir had to be baptized. And so he consented to the change in religious identity, and at the very same time, in a display of goodwill, a goodwill gesture, good faith to the Byzantine Empire, Vladimir demanded the conversion of all his subjects along with him, the entire kingdom of Rus, known as the first mass baptism of Kiev. Soon afterwards, Kiev was built up to look like a modernized Constantinople. These large cathedrals were built in the city and in the surrounding areas, and Christianity began to spread in the north. This is the foundation story of the Slavic Church, and I would say that there's a convincing argument, to me at least, that if you want to understand what's happening this week in Ukraine, you need to understand something about the religious history of the region both ancient and modern. Now, obviously, that's not going to give you a full image, a full explanation of what's happening. The entire geopolitical situation is vastly complex, I'm sure, and it, it depends on understandings of resource extraction, on sociopolitical spheres of influence, on economic dependencies, on historical precedent. Who knows what else? But one thing that we underestimate to our peril is the power of a foundation myth, the power of a founding story to galvanize a people. And one thing that a good deal of Western reporting has overlooked this past week is the fact that Russia is not a secular country, and Vladimir Putin is not operating from a secular playbook. The founding myth of the introduction of Christianity to the Russian people is an incredibly important identity marker, and its cradle, the ancient city of Kiev, remains an important symbol of that identity. Like I said before, though, it's not just the ancient history of the Slavic Church that we need to understand, it's also the modern history, including the personal religiosity of Vladimir Putin himself as much as we can. It's said that he was born to an atheist father and a religious mother who had him baptized in secret. Regularly, he can be seen participating in religious events. He's often photographed walking with the, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church. He's filmed attending Mass or um, diving into the waters on the Epiphany Feast. 
He's well known to wear a small aluminum cross around his neck at all times, and in multiple interviews, when asked about the cross, he's described how it was given to him by his mother prior to a visit to the Holy Land, and how it always stays with him now. In the campaign against ISIS, it was reported that part of Putin's expressed desire was to preserve the historic homeland of Christianity. There was a religious motivation to that campaign, too. Over the years, the ties between the church and the state in Russia have grown increasingly close, all while the Russian Orthodox Church has ballooned in size and in membership. When Putin was reestablished as president in 2012, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, Archbishop Kirill, called his work a miracle of God over the past 12 years. In 2017, it was reported that since the collapse of the Soviet Union, 25,000 churches and 800 monasteries had been built. There were 90 churches being built or restored every single week in Russia. And among those, one of the most grandiose and overt displays of the connection of the church and state was the main cathedral of the Russian Armed Forces. It was consecrated on June 14th, 2020, less than two years ago. Many people around the world, myself included, sat there that day, watching in horror as a monument to military might and dominance was consecrated to the glory of the resurrected Christ, the one whose first words to those who had betrayed him were, Peace be with you. I think there's a very real sense in which the Russian church and Vladimir Putin both believe themselves to be introducing a renewal of Christendom, the triumphal power of the church and its place of preeminence and its place of predominance in society. Meanwhile, as the Kremlin and the Russian Orthodox Church grew closer and closer aligned in their intentions and in their privileges, another conflict was brewing on the Western religious flank. In December 2018, while Ukraine continued to lobby for recognition as a member state of NATO, an important meeting was taking place in Kyiv called the Unification Council. In this meeting, the three Eastern Orthodox churches with jurisdiction within Ukraine joined together to form a newly established Ukrainian Orthodox Church, or the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Now, part of the reason for that movement was that that was a precondition for recognition by the Ecumenical Patriarchate as an autocephalous Orthodox Church. So, in the same way that the Anglican Church of Canada is a separate church from the Church of England, which is a separate church from the Episcopal Church in the United States, the Orthodox churches hold a unified communion of independently governed churches. The recognition of autocephaly, or self-governance, for the Ukrainian Orthodox Church was huge, and it led to the greatest schism in the Christian world ever since the Protestant Reformation when in 2019 the Russian Orthodox Church declared itself out of communion with the Ecumenical Patriarchate. The loss of the Ukrainian Church from Moscow's sphere of influence on the very site of Russian Orthodoxy's baptism was unbearable for Moscow. Now that's really just a brief overview a quick synopsis of some of the major events of the timeline of religious history in the region. And you might fairly ask what all of that has to do with the current invasion of Ukraine this week. And in response to that, I would offer what I think is an incredibly revealing excerpt from a presidential address made by Vladimir Putin to the Federal Assembly in 2014, the same year as the annexation of Crimea. It was in Crimea, he says, in the ancient city of Chersonesus, of Korsun, or Korsun as ancient Russian chroniclers called it, that Grand Prince Vladimir was baptized before bringing Christianity to Rus. In addition to ethnic similarity, a common language, common elements of their material culture, a common territory, even though its borders were not marked then, and a nascent common economy and government, 
Christianity was a powerful spiritual unifying force that helped involve various tribes and tribal unions of the vast Eastern Slavic world in the creation of a Russian nation and a Russian state. It was thanks to the spiritual unity that our forefathers for the first time and forevermore saw themselves as a united nation. All of this allows us to say that Crimea, the ancient Corson or Chersonesus, and Sevastopol have invaluable civilizational and even sacral importance for Russia, like the Temple Mount in Jerusalem for the followers of Islam and Judaism. The explicit invocation of a sacred history cannot be ignored in current attempts to understand the events of this week. Is there more going on than that? Of course there's more going on than that. It may just be one tiny fragment of the story, but sacred memory has always, always played an incredibly important role in galvanizing the strength of believers, especially before a major event, and even more especially before a matter of great sacrifice, when you're calling others to sacrifice allowing people to write themselves into a story that spans history, that transcends the world that they know, is an incredibly powerful and astute move. And Vladimir Putin, whether he believes it himself or not, who knows, only God knows that. But whether he believes it or not, he is an incredibly strategic thinker. The story of the Transfiguration is a powerful example of just that. Jesus goes up the mountain, traditionally Mount Tabor, and there in the presence of Peter and John and James, he's transfigured, turned into this glowing heavenly body, and joined, importantly, by Moses and Elijah, the prototypes of the law and the prophets, the summary, the foundation of the Jewish scriptures and teaching. The disciples are able to read Jesus, and by extension, they're able to read themselves into the long lineage of salvation history brought about by God for their people. This moment, this one vision of Jesus in heavenly glory is significant enough that many de decades later is referenced in the second letter of Peter in chapter 1, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my Beloved with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. This event was what inspired Peter and James and John in the calls to ministry that they received following the death and resurrection of Jesus. This is what inspired Peter as he walked with Jesus into Jerusalem towards the cross. The principal difference between the movement of Jesus the Christ and the movement of Vladimir Putin is the orientation towards which their energies are turned. The latter has put his followers into the service of political, economic, cultural, and military domination. It's become very clear this week that the sacred story upon which they're drawing to ground their military operation doesn't translate into the sacred lives of those that they consider expendable or worse, deserving of death. The, the military machine that's currently driving itself towards Kyiv at this very moment has no concern for the sacredness of the individual human lives it's sacrificing at the altar of power, as has happened so many times before with so many so-called Christian empires. Jesus, by contrast, used that connection to the sacred story of his people in order to turn his disciples away from violence into a self-giving love that led as far as his own death and burial. The strength of conviction that James and John and Peter 
were receiving that day, it was meant for the sake of death, not for the sake of power. Death in the service of peace. Not just peace in the abstract future sense, which war is always said to be in search of, but peace in the immediate sense, a peace which puts an end to violence, a peace which cuts the cycle of hate and terror and death. Make no mistake, if there really is a religious dimension to this current conflict in Ukraine, it will not stop with Ukraine. It may not stop there even without a religious element, but if the Kremlin is waging an ideological war, not just a physical war, not just a, a, a military operation as they've called it, but it's, it's waging an ideological war combined with its proven commitment to disinformation, we will all feel its effects at some point, and we will all be made susceptible to that persistently encroaching myth that in violence and in power will be our salvation. The witness of Jesus is something very different. And the true test of discipleship ahead lies in how tightly we can hold to that conviction that the one that we hail as the Prince of Peace, the one who went to the cross for the sake of the world, is the model for our relationship to power and privilege in this life. For Jesus, and for the heart of Christianity itself, the function of sacred history, sacred story, and sacred power is never going to be dominion or domination. It will always be self-giving love. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of this day. Empower us by your Holy Spirit to boldly live the gospel and shine with your transforming glory as people changed and continuing to change. Just as your son drew apart to be in prayer with you, we offer our prayers for the transformation of the world and the church, saying, transforming God, Hear our prayer. God of peace, we pray for the nations of the earth, that leaders of all nations would seek pathways to peace and the common good of all people. We especially pray for the resolution of conflicts in Eastern Europe, the Ukraine and Russia, in the Middle East, Africa, 
South America, and civil unrest throughout the world. We pray that your divine compassion for humankind would permeate every region of the world and bring about lasting change. Transforming God, hear our prayer. In the Worldwide Anglican Cycle of Prayer today, we pray for the life and ministry of the Anglican Church of Kenya and the Right Reverend Jackson Ole Sapit, Primate. In the Anglican Church of Canada, we pray for the Right Reverend John Organ, Bishop, and the clergy and people of the Diocese of Western Newfoundland. In the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, we pray for the Dean, Council, and congregations of the Georgian, Huronia, and Bay areas of the Eastern Synod. Remembering the Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples, we pray for youth in all Indigenous parishes and territories throughout Canada and for all those who teach and guide them. In this Diocese of Kootenai, we pray for the work of all diocesan committees including the regional deans, Bishop Lynn McNaughton, Christine Ross, Archdeacon, Neil Elliott, Dean of West and East Kootenai Regions, Chris Harwood Jones, Dean of North Okanagan Region, for Anne Privet, Dean of Central Okanagan Region, Nick Pang, Dean of South Okanagan Region, and David Thiessen, Dean of Kootenai. In this parish of St. Saviour's, we pray for the ministry of all laity and clergy. Lord, guide and form your church throughout the world into the likeness of Christ. Transforming God, hear our prayer. We also pray for the lonely, sick, hungry, persecuted, or ignored. Today we pray especially for those who have asked for our prayers. Together we pray for Ali, Allison, Alice, Andrea, Art, B, Brent, Bruce M, for Callie, Cyril, Dan, Darren and Anri, Dave and Bev, Dave J, for Doug, Dylan, Effie, Emily, Frank S., Frida and Grant, Gabe, Gavin, for Ken and Jean F., Jake, Janessa, Janet, Jeremy, Lou, Luke and Yala and family, Maida, Margareta, for Marlene, Merle and Gilbert, Nathan and Chloe, Pat, Patsy, Peter, Peter B., for Simone, Spencer and Diana, Terry G, Terry Mick, Terry. Compassionate Lord, comfort, heal, and sustain each one of these. Transforming God, hear our prayer. Loving God, you revealed your glory and presence in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Receive our prayers today. Reveal the glory and presence of your spirit alive in the world today. Free us from all doubts and empower us to act as a transfigured people for the sake of your mission in the world. Amen. Almighty God, on the holy mount, you revealed to chosen witnesses your well-beloved Son, wonderfully transfigured. Mercifully deliver us from the darkness of this world and change us into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, once again, friends, good morning and welcome to St. Saviour's Online. It is good indeed to be with you. Today we're reading as part of our uh, commitment to reconciliation, the call to action from the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, call to action number 33. It reads, We call upon the federal, provincial, and territorial governments to recognize as a high priority the need to address and prevent fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, FASD, and to develop in collaboration with Aboriginal people FASD preventative programs that can be delivered in a culturally appropriate manner. That is the 33rd call to action of the TRC final report. Well, a number of things coming up this week. As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, today is the final Sunday in the season after the Epiphany, and so Lent will be beginning this coming week. Today, after our service, our 10 o'clock airing of the service, we have coffee hour on Zoom. The link for that can be found in Parish Life. This is our final Sunday coffee hour for a while. We are heading back to in-person worship, making that available as of next week, and so we won't be able to run coffee hour um, anymore after this. Uh, we do hope that as many of you as are able will be able to come out and join us today. Ash Wednesday, we are having an in-person service, and it will begin at 3 p.m., both in person and online. There will be a separate online edition of the Ash Wednesday service that will be uploaded um, by then. So Ash Wednesday, 3 p.m. in person and online. Before that, though, at 2 p.m., we're going to be opening up the church for anybody who would like to pray through the Stations of the Cross or the Way of the Cross. This is a, an old tradition, an old devotional, and one that we've done before at St. Saviour's, but um, we've just purchased a brand new set of the Stations of the Cross and had them installed in the church. So feel free to come on out on Wednesday at 2 p.m. We're also going to be opening up the church every Friday morning throughout the season of Lent at 11 a.m. So we're going to do it this way. Um, at 9.30, if you'd like to join us on Zoom for Centering Prayer, please come join us on Zoom for Centering Prayer every Friday morning at 9.30. Then at 11 o'clock, in person at the church, for those who would like to pray the Stations of the Cross together, if that's something that you're interested in, will begin at 11 a.m. Now, if you want to come afterwards to pray it on your own in a, in a place where you'll have some more space to yourself, um, and be able to keep distanced from other people, then you can come anytime following 11 a.m. before 12 p.m. Um, and you can you can simply walk through it. There will be instructions. There will be a booklet for you to pray through it with on your own. So that is every Friday in Lent beginning at 11 a.m. Also, following um, the 11 o'clock group um, prayer through the stations, uh, the the sacrament of confession and absolution will be made available. So if there's anybody who would like to partake in that um, private confession, then please feel free to come by and request that as well. It would be helpful if you made an appointment for that one, though. Not necessary, but helpful. So that's Friday mornings through the season of Lent. Um, Hymn sing. We had a lovely, wonderful hymn sing yesterday. We're going to be bringing hymn sing back, and it's going to be happening on a monthly basis from here on out. So, the second Saturday of every month, we'll have hymn sing online on Zoom at 10 a.m. like normal. All the information of that, as always, can be found in Parish Life. Next Sunday, um, as mentioned before, we will be meeting in person and online. The online options will still be available and will continue to be made available for anybody who um, feels that's the best for them for whatever reason. Um, 
you can attend in person or you can attend online. Our in-person worship, we are asking you to please register for the time being um, while we ease back into our in-person um, gatherings. So please register either by filling out the registration link or by contacting the office by phone or by email. Finally, we're going to be holding a Lenten study this year through the season of Lent again. It will be happening on Wednesdays at 3 p.m., just like our previous discussions have been happening. Um, the first one will be taking place on March 9th. So on March 2nd, we have the Ash Wednesday service, so we won't have a, a session that day. But March 9th, we will be having hold, holding a session um, that will be happening on Zoom. I believe those are all the announcements that I've got. Um, my friends, I hope that you're all well and healthy and safe. I know that the events of Ukraine um, are on the hearts and the minds of many, many of us this week. I hope that you're able to enter into a place of prayer for the people of Ukraine and for safety and peace in the region for all who um, are involved in this in whatever capacity, be they victim, be they perpetrator, whoever. I hope that you're able to um, find space in your hearts to pray for them, as we all must. And now, my friends, as we go out into the world, the big, wide world, may the God of infinite goodness scatter the darkness of sin. May God brighten your hearts with holiness. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.